The Dodo world is vast and rich, from the treacherous waters around the clad isles to the ghastly eerie in the sky, from the glaciers in the bitter north to the thorny waste and hazardal desert in the south. Asian-inspired cultures, South American-inspired gods, and European-inspired kingdoms in constant battle. Together, we will embark on a journey to discover the biomes, cultures, people, and stories of different regions of the Dota world. This is Dota Geography. So, there's two different main locations we are going to talk about today, the Clad Isles and the sunken cities of Cray. The Clad Isles are to the far west, with the Submarine Sea to the south, and the Boiling Sea in the northwest. Strong currents from the Boiling Sea mix the waters between Clad and the north very treacherous for sailors, but also provides warmth for a thriving underwater wildlife. Up the narrow channel to the east of Clad, we have the western forests and western mountain regions, as well as the southernmost parts of the north. To the east of the north, in the black waters of the northern sea, we find Cray and the Dark Reef, where the grottos host the sunken cities of the Slytherin people. Clad consists of many isles. To the far south, we have the Isle of Songs, a very warm place flourishing with life. Spiders, hermit crabs, sharks, weasels, and colorful birds are found here and in the southwestern parts of Clad. The narrow channel is an aquatic passage between Clad and the western forests, which gives easy access to Augury Bay without having to sail through the harsh currents in the north. Further up the channel and to the east of Clad lies Shade Shore. The warm beaches, forests and rivers makes it very hospitable for both wildlife and people. The southern parts of Shade Shore should be avoided though because man-eating mangroves grow here. Maranths, a type of sea-dwelling people that I will come back to, also lives from Shade Shore and all the way up the channel to the sunken cities. At the northern end of the channel we find Port Meginin. Outside it is the infamous Recluse Reef where strong currents, sharp corals, hammerhead sharks and enormous barnacles have been rumored to drag down ships. You can also find Kraken tortoises, which are hunted for their tough shells and to be eaten since they are a known delicacy. Kraken tortoises should not be confused with actual krakens though, enormous octopus and squid-like creatures who are rumored to be found further into the depths of the boiling sea. In the middle of the Rokruz reef waters, we find the Trembling Isle. Tree weasels used to inhabit it before they were driven off, and demons too used to reside on the cataract. Before we talk about Cray, I highly advise you to watch my videos about the north if you haven't. Beyond the frozen crag in the north, you find the Odobene script. Through the crypt you can find a secret passage to Reef's Edge, a shallow part of Dark Reef which is where most of the sunken cities of Cray is found. Dire gulls, Emobites and Umisars guard the shallows of the Dark Reef. The grottos of Dark Reef is the location of Cray and the sunken cities. While not advised, because of the dangers of the deep, if you continue from the reef's edge you find the shoal, another place in the shallows around Dark Reef. Here you find the sunken passage which leads you into one of the Cray grottos, the Dark Reef prison. Here are the worst criminals of the sea are kept. Galvanite scholars and slitherines guard the prison. Animals found in Dark Reef include reef bottom ravagers, eels, enormous anemones, glow conches, daggerfish, furry fish, octopi, and terrifying meat-eating guttle slugs, who are the size of a slitherin and devour dead prisoners. The coral breach is another location in Cray, and there we find the deep vault where the treasures of the deep are hidden. Sea dragons, a hunted dragon race, reside in the black waters, and a hybrid between sea dragons and ice worms called azure dragons are found in Dark Reef and the Frostbite Tundra. The people of the sea are known as Maranths, and to the Maranths, everyone from above the surface are known as drylanders. Within the term Maranth, we have the races Leviaths, Murs, and Slytherin. The inhabitants of Cray are mostly Slytherins. Within the Slytherin race, we have the subraces Nagas and Umizars. The hero Naga Siren is a Naga. Umizars and other Slytherins sometimes gather in the grottos of Cray to partake in blood sports, but Nagas are a race of higher culture and are known for their beautiful snake-like monuments in the Naga cities. A few notable Slytherins are Naga Siren, Slark and Sardar. Sardar is not a Naga or Umizar, he is another type of Slytherin. Slark might be only half Slytherin and the other half Leviath. Leviaths are a race of Maranth 
with two feet and fishy heads who live in the shallow recluse reef, unlike the Slytherin, who typically have a snaky lower body with no typically humanoid legs and deep water fish like lures, and live in the depths of the dark reef. The hero Tidehunter is one such leviathan. Mer are half fish, half human, and are unfortunately looked down upon by not only humans, but also other Meranths. Mers are found in both Cray and Shadeshore. The hero Sven has a mare mother and human father, making him half Drylander and half Mer. It's likely that because of this reason, he wears a mask to hide his fishy features. Sven is from Shadeshore, more specifically, the Shadeshore ruins. The inland parts of Shadeshore is inhabited by Drylanders, and the waters and beaches by Meranths. Sven's mother has been described as a pallid Meranth, and that is likely because she was very ill. Pallid means pale. Sven's father was a vigil knight, a faction of knights following a very strict code. When Sven's father broke the code, presumably by having a bastard child by a mare, which the vigil knights consider an abomination, he was executed. Later Sven's mother died from her illness, making Sven an orphan. Sven hid his identity and joined the vigil knight faction, where he studied for 13 years. But on the ensuing ceremony day, he got his revenge for his father by burning down the vigil codex. The Vigil Keep is the base of the Vigil Knights, and where they have their artifacts, which includes the Vigil Codex, the Outcast Blade, the Sacred Helm, and the Holy Flame. The Holy Flame is a blue, ever-burning fire kept in the inner colonnade, and it was this Sven used to burn the Vigil Codex. It is protected by the Flame Guard, a sect among the Vigil Knights who are exceptionally skilled swordsmen who reside in the inner colonnade. The Vigil Codex is a set of rules the Vigil Knights have to follow. Sven has made his own codex, but he is still very inspired by the ones from his former faction. Other sects within the Vigil Knights is the Monomelites, who hunt down those who don't follow the Vigil Codex, like for example Sven's father. They wear helms that covers the wearer's eyes, and instead use a type of gemstone called cat's eye gemstones to give the wearer enhanced vision. Then there's also the sect the Chiseled Guard, an ancient and forgotten faction we know very little about. But I think I know something from connecting a few dots, which you can hear more about in the events and speculation part of this video. When Sven almost destroyed the Vigil Knights, he shattered the Sacred Helm I mentioned and took the Outcast Blade for himself. He also took an Iron Gauntlet, which he used to cast the spell Stormhammer. He didn't completely destroy the Vigil Knights though, so to this day, they still try to hunt him down to reclaim the enormous Outcast Blade he took. It's very powerful and can cut through many units at the same time. Sven owns many other blades too, among them the Sword of the Warrior's Retribution. It used to belong to his father, but was passed down to him after his father's execution. He also has the sword the Vigil Triumph from one of the Vigil ships. Just like Kunkka, the Vigil Knights of Clad also fares the seas. Lastly, of the swords worth mentioning, there's the Adjudicator's, Bla Adjudicator's Blade. <laughs> which Sven used to cleave the hero Juggernaut's helm in half. This awakened Juggernaut's ancestors trapped in his mask in the form of two dragons. The Juggernaut is grateful for this because it made him more powerful than ever. Shadeshore is also the home of Slark after he escaped the Dark Rift prison. He lives in the southern parts of Shadeshore, likely hiding near the dangerous carnivorous mangroves. South of the Shadeshore waters, Kunkka once looted a prince's treasure ship sailing through the narrow channel and found the ceremonial rapier. To the west of the entry of the narrow channel is the Isle of Songs, where Kunko was gifted a sash of spider silk by a princess there. North of Shadeshore is Port Mignin, which is likely the town Kunko is from, as well as the suicide mages. Young Kunko served as a midshipman and was very ambitious. He heard legends of giant sharks, which he proved true as an adult when he hunted them down. Kunko was the admiral of the mighty Cladish navy and sworn to protect his homeland of Clad. I will come back to Kunko and Tidehunter in the events of speculation parts of this video. For now, I will only cover his basics. He comes from a long line of seamen and has fought many battles, one of which happened at Port Mignon, where he got his tsunami blade, and one at the Trembling Isle, where he took his enemy's captain's hat after winning the battle. This is not the same battle as the one between Kunkka and Tidehunter, which also happened later at the Trembling Isle. Clad is known for its steel, which is exceptionally strong. The Cladish navy uses this steel in their weapons of choice, which is sabers and flintlock pistols. One special Cladish sword is Tidebringer, which is Kunkka's personal weapon. 
It can strike multiple enemies at the same time, and it is likely that similar technology or magic was used on this sword as the cleaving outcast blade Sven took from the Vigil Keep. Tidebringer is empowered by a lost cladish soul, likely from the second battle at the Trembling Isle between Kunga and Tidehunter. The cladish navy's colors are blue and gold, and the seal of honor they give to veterans are made in the shape of a falcon. The god Poseidon is not mentioned in any other lore than Zeus's, but if anyone worships him, it's perhaps the cladish people, the Cray people, or both. Other deities believed on clad is Polymorphia. He is a watery being capable of eternal patterns, and Morphling worships him. It is also possible that Polymorphia is not a god of this plane, and Morphling took the faith with him from space. The hero Morphling crashed down on this planet a very long time ago, and landed in the ancient Vloy, west in clad. At the time, there was a big war going on in Vloy, but when Morphling crashed down, they joined forces to fight him. This was a mistake though, because Morphling easily shifted from form to form and eventually defeated them all. Morphling has become sort of a deity himself, and one Umizar from the deep waters of the Boiling Sea pays tribute to him in exchange for news of the surface world. Lastly, we have Maelron the Tentacular. He is worshipped by the Leviaths and might be the very god of the oceans. He lives in a gigantic whirlpool, perhaps in the ocean depths, perhaps not in this plane. He is described as he who cracked the world, which might suggest he split the land and created the seas. In many ways, Melron seems to have a lot in common with Cthulhu, an enormous, frightening, tentacled beast. We have already talked a bit about Cray, and we'll talk more about it when we talk about Siltsbreaker in the events and speculation parts of this video, but here is the basics of the culture there. Cray is the location of all the sunken cities of the Dark Reef Grottoes and the depths of the Black Waters. This is a hotspot for Slytherin. The most notable places are Dark Reef Prison and Deep Vault. Dark Reef Prison is located near a Naga settlement in a deep ocean trench. The trench is covered by a metallic grid and the inside of the prison is described as a labyrinth. Explosives, hostile wildlife and guards keep up the security and several shipwrecks lie around the entrance in the shallows. The prison is ruthless and only the toughest bad boys survive. One of which is Slark, who did not only survive, but also managed to escape. He was part of the Dark Reef Dozen, a group of prisoners who together tried to escape. Ten of them died, two were recaptured and executed, and only one hidden thirteenth actually managed to escape, the only one to ever do so. That was Slark. Slark also claims that one day, Dark Reef will rise, but it's unknown what exactly this means. It might be connected to a brewing new possible conflict between the Drylanders and the Maranth if Siltbreaker was to escape. Slark might worship some deities called the Dark Ones, who he made a dark pact with. I mentioned the goddess Skadi in my video about the North, and she might also be worshipped in Cray. The Eye of Skadi, a weapon possibly made from her eyes, is guarded by Azure Dragons. Another Skadi weapon was forged from materials found in Dark Reef. The second notable place in Cray is the Deep Vault. It's defended by the Slytherin Guard, a Slytherin military faction. Deep Vault is located in Coral Breach, an ocean canyon at the southern end of Dark Reef. Within the Slytherin Guard is a special force called the Deep Ones, who only guard the treasure, and the High Sworn, who are the elite members of the Slytherin Guard. They follow a strict oath about their obligations. Notable members of the Slytherin Guard are the hero Slardar and Naga Siren, who was a High Sworn. Naga Siren was banished after a chalice was stolen from Deep Vault, which I will get back to. The peace between Drylanders and Maranth is held up by the Conclave of the Brine, a faction of Mare who are half man, half fish. Because they are half human, it's suspected that their human greed makes them care more about power than actually keeping peace, though. For more in depth explanation of Siltbreaker, Maelron, and the Maranths, watch these three Lorgasm videos by Sir Action Slacks. This is my short version, and the order of each event as I have interpreted it. It's entirely up to you to make your own decision on how you think it went down. So, let's went back and start a long time ago, back when the Drylanders and Maranths were at war. I believe that it wasn't just ocean dwellers versus surface people. It was specifically Slytherin versus the Vigil Knights. Oh my god, I'm getting goosebumps just thinking about it. <laughs> Hear me out. The Chisel Guard is an ancient and forgotten faction of the Vigil Knights who kept something safe. 
The Vigil Knights, we know from Sven's lore, considers human mare hybrid offspring an abomination. The Vigil Knights are hostile to Maresca the Dark Willow. For now, all you have to believe is that the original war between land and ocean was between Slytherin and the Vigil Knights, and we will come back to these three points later to explain why they might prove my theory. Anyways, eventually the Conclave of the Brine gets peace between the land and the ocean, and what do you know, the Conclave consists of mare, half human, half fish people. A lot of time passes and peace is kept, but then the Battle of Cray happened. A bunch of Leviaths who worship Melron wanted to loot the treasures of the Slytherin sunken cities in Cray, because as we know from the Archronicus poem, in a very cold region, there are old legends of treasure. Remember how I said the chiseled guard was keeping something safe? I think this was the gem. After the war between the Drylanders and Slytherin was over, the gem went from being in the Vigil Knight's possession to the Slytherin. Either through war loot or as a peace offering. And then, after a very long time, the Leviaths wanted to steal the gem, which was used to adorn a chalice. The Leviaths were eventually driven away, but the chalice was missing. This caused the Naiga Siren to be banished until she could recover it, with Slardar helping her trying to catch the thief. The thief, if we believe Sir Action Slax's theory, might be Slark, who then gave it to Melron. Then Melron put it into a beast which stranded on a beach in the north. The alternate theory, however, which I will tell because it allows me to intertwine Stiltbreaker, tells a different story. My own personal theory is that the Conclave of the Brine, in charge of keeping peace, stole the gem. Nowhere do we know for sure that Melron ever obtained the gem or even held it up until this point. However, we do know that the Conclave of the Brine, cursed with the greed for power by their half-human blood and tired of being shunned by everyone, might want this gem to finally get power. If the peace between the land and the ocean was so fragile, then having a truly powerful godlike being on their side would be a great tool for keeping conflict at bay by fear. So when one of the Conclave members, who we all know as Siltbreaker, was in need of healing, they put the gem inside of him. Siltbreaker, mind you, hated his dryland heritage. So what if he was meant to only be used as a threat, never actually attacking and accidentally start the war? Well, he rampaged anyways and was jailed in Dark Reef. He was bind by runes to keep him down, holding him tighter the more he struggled. So somehow, he transferred some of his power to the drowned scorpion Rysik in the Calabar Desert in Nishai. The Conclave hired Hitman, which as you know from the Lorgasm episodes, might be the heroes you play in the Siltbreaker event. The Conclave wanted to erase their mistake. The heroes killed Rysik, but meanwhile, Siltbreaker's power returned to him, and through mind control, he managed to hypnotize the Slytherins guarding his prison cell into freeing him. The heroes then go to the Frozen Crag in the north, to the Odebena script, enter Dark Reef and defeat Siltbreaker. Then Siltbreaker's body washes up on a shore in the north, likely at the northernmost part of it, and there it lies for a while, the gem still in Siltbreaker's now silenced chest. <sighs> okay. From the poem about Melron, we learn that Kunkka and his fleet of three ships sail north and finds a beast with a gem inside. After obtaining the gem, they now get true sight of ghosts warning them about traveling too far away to the deep waters. Kunkka and his Kladish navy goes anyway and close in on the trembling isle. Then they get ambushed by the demons of the cataract and need help from the Kladish suicide mages. They sacrifice themselves in order to aid with ancestral spirits, but just when the battle looks to be going in Kunkka's favor, BOOM! Tidehunter emerges. The ship Tidehunter was closing in on dropped an anchor on his head, an abandoned ship, but Tidehunter was not ready to go up. He returns with Melron's crack in wrath and destroys the ship. No gem. Kunkka's fleet tries to escape, but then the tentacles drag down a second ship. Still no gem. Now, the fate of the third ship, the one Kunkka, the gem, and Maresca the Dark Willow is on, is a bit unclear. At first, I thought it got safely to shore, and then Melron would not rest until the gem was returned, making Tide forever hunting Kunkka, you know. But, if we look at the last three parts of the Melron poem and Kunkka's lore, it could be that the third ship sank as well. This explains Kunkka's ghost ship 
and how he washed up on Kinus shores after the battle. The Kinish shores, by the way, is the Frosted Winds tribe, where Kanka would form his new, now Kinish crew on a brand new ship. But wait, Dark Willow was present during the battle? Okay, hold up. Let's look at some of the relationships of Dark Willow and let's try to connect some dots. She was present at the ship containing the gem and she was searching for trophies. We also know she altered the battle in a way that affected the Cladish navy negatively. She blames Tidehunter for this. Also, like I mentioned, the Vigil Knights are hunting her. Dark Willow stole the gem, making the Cladish navy lose true sight to fight Melron and blames Tidehunter for summoning Melron in the first place. She just wanted to steal the gem. The Vigil Knights want the gem so they can get the power to go to war against the ocean again, like the Chisel Guard did so long ago, which is why they are hunting her. They want to go to war against the oceans after rebuilding their faction after Sven, the half mare abomination, freaked them over to get their revenge against their nemesis race once and for all. The Vigil Knights originally had the gem and that made them powerful enough to fight Melron and the Maranths. The Mers at the Conclave are terrified of war, so they stole it from the Slytherine and used it to make Siltbreaker to scare the Vigil Knights. Everyone wants to get their hands on the gem, but for now, Mereska holds it. She might have stolen it, but perhaps it's for the best that none of the sides have it. She might be a brat, but at least she doesn't take either side. <laughs> Am I crazy? What do you think? Honestly? I'm convinced, but I'm not sure if I have explained everything sufficient enough. You can always cross-check everything and decide for yourself, and I highly again must stress that you must watch all three of Slax's Dota Ocean Lorgasm videos. They explain everything in much more detail. So the only thing that I know for a fact is very incorrect in all of this is that the Mailrun poem takes place in Southward's End but I placed it in the north. This is only for consistency and a cohesive story. And um, yeah, it, 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 uh, I'm sorry, it doesn't actually make sense. Floy and Morphling is just a super wild guess, but I couldn't fit him anywhere else. The cataract could be placed a bit further away, but it doesn't really matter. The rest of my clad decisions I have explained in my previous episode about the north. I placed Shade Shore in clad because the Vigil Knights and Kunkka have a lot in common, and Sven is present in Artifact. Clad is also in Maranth waters, since we know Tidehunter frequents the place, so Shade Shore should either be part of Clad, or the North, or both. Because Slark is hiding there, I assume it can't be near Cray, and the fauna doesn't seem very northern, so I figured it must be in the warmer boiling sea. As always, I'd like to give a final disclaimer that this is my project made by me, so I've made decisions and interpreted the Dota lore and placed things in a way that is logical to me. If you disagree, I'd love to hear your thoughts, and I'm updating the map constantly. Make sure you always have the latest version, which now is version 2.2. It's linked in the description and comments. Check out previous episodes if you haven't, and I really hope you will join me in the future episodes to come as well. In the next episode, we will visit the Western Mountains, where we find, among other things, Stonehall and Legion Commander, Knollen and Sniper, and the fields of Endless Carnage and Pudge. Thank you for being a part of this tour. I can't wait to see you around. Peace! <laughs>